<clears throat> in any case, when I was 28, to make a long story short, some friends of mine gave me a copy of the Quran. <clears throat> and one night I was sitting in Diamond Heights, my apartment in Diamond Heights in San Francisco. I was working that time at the University of San Francisco. I was 27, 28 at that time, I can't remember. And I ran out of stuff to read, and I took this gift that my friends gave me, and I began to read it. And I came to the first verse, well, I opened the Quran, read the first page, then the second, and then very quickly, in the second surah, about 37 verses into the Quran, I came upon the story of mankind. And uh, I have to admit, I read through it very quickly. It was about nine, ten verses long. Story of the first man and woman. And I recognized some of the details. It was similar to what I had learned when I was a child. But I noticed that there was something wrong. It was apparent to me that whoever authored this Quran, of course, I wasn't a Muslim at the time, so I didn't have any idea who that was. Whoever authored this Quran clearly did not understand the real meaning of the story. Because they had obviously gotten the details confused. They even un didn't even understand the whole purpose of the story. <clears throat> and so uh, I just read through it once, and then I read through it again, just to try to see what kind of point the author was making. And then I read through it a third time and a fourth, and then I realized this is something strange going on here. I'm going to read this much more carefully. I'm going to need to go through this story line by line, verse by verse, because it's obvious that the author is trying to bring out another point and I wasn't quite sure what it was, but definitely he packs a lot of meaning into almost every word. And I thought the writer at least seems to have a great measure of brilliance. And so I'll try to sort of take you through what my experience was as quickly as I can. So I came to the second, the 30th verse of the second surah, Surah Al-Baqarah, and it began like this. It said, behold, your Lord said to the angels, I am going to place a vicegerent on earth. The Arabic word is khalifa. It means a representative or an emissary of mine. I am going to place a vicegerent on earth. And they said, the angels said, will you place therein one who will spread corruption and shed blood while we celebrate your praises and glorify your holiness? And God said, he said, truly I know what you do not know. See, that's the verse that hooked me. That's the verse that caught my attention. That's the one that kept on making me read the story again and again and again. Because listen to the way it begins. Behold, your Lord said to the angels, I'm going to place a representative of mine on earth, a vicegerent of mine, an emissary, one who acts on my behalf. I thought, that, that's not the way it goes. <laughs> You're not supposed to be placing man on the earth in some positive role, <laughs> some elective office. You place man as a, on earth as a punishment for his sin. Clearly, I knew the author didn't quite get the point. But still, it was an amazing line. But then I come to the next line, and it says, And the angels say, Will you place her in one who will spread corruption and shed blood? While we celebrate your praises and glorify you? I looked at it again. I couldn't believe the question. They said, Will you place her in one who will spread corruption and shed blood? while we, the angels, celebrate your praises and glorify you? I looked at that and I said, exactly. That would be my question. Why would you create this being, supposedly for some positive role, when he's capable of doing tremendous wrongdoing? When he could spread corruption and shed much blood? Why would you create this violent and pernicious creature when you could create angels, as the angels clearly say. Well, we, well, we, the angels, celebrate your praises and glorify you. They were asking one of the most fundamental questions in the entire history of religion. Why create you, man, this utterly fallible creature, this creature who could rebel against God's will, who could do such tremendous wrongdoing, who could wreak havoc like no other creature on earth, when you can make them angels. And look where the question is being asked. It's being asked in heaven. It's almost like saying, look, why don't you just make them angels and be up here in heaven with us, you know? Why don't you just make them angels, pop them into heaven, he's fine. Why would you put him on earth where he could feel distant from you, where he could work out his worst criminal tendencies, act them out, feeling somehow independent and apart from you and free to do whatever he wants, 
when you could just make them angels and put them in heaven and make them perfectly submissive to your will? I looked at that question and said, that's my question. I'm not, I'm one, not even a single verse into the story of mankind and there before me I see my question. That whole question, everything that I ever thought, everything that I ever experienced, everything that I ever knew was in that question. It was as if the author took my life and wanted to pick out exactly the right question to humiliate me, to provoke me, to anger me. Why create man, this most destructive and violent creature, when you can make him angels? And then look at the answer. And he said, God said, truly I know what you do not know. You know, in modern parlance, we would say, I know exactly what I'm doing. I read that and said, what? You know what you do not know? You know exactly what you're doing? Well, please inform me. Tell me what you're doing. Because, you know, I'm, I'm 28 years old and I haven't figured out it yet. And I have a lot of issues that I'm still dealing with that's connected to this question. You can't just get off that easy. You can't just tell me you know exactly what you're doing. Not after what I've been through. Not after you made me this way. And then I realized, of course, I was arguing with a God I didn't even believe in. And that would happen several times as I read through the Quran. And sometimes I would just get into such, so, so agitated by what I read, I'd start arguing with this voice that's, that's, that I'm reading before me, that's calling to me. So we turn to the next verse. Well, it turns out that the Quran just doesn't dismiss the question. It starts to answer it a little bit. And in the next verse it says, and he taught Adam, God taught Adam, the names of all things. And then he placed them before the angels and said, tell me their names if you are right. So this verse is clearly referring to the previous one. But notice what it says. Now, I, I, from my own background, I remember Adam naming things. But it wasn't connected to any answer to any philosophical question. But here, notice what it says. And he taught Adam the names of all things. And I realized already, just from the first verse, you got to read these verses very carefully because it's packed with a lot of symbolism and meaning. And he taught Adam the names of all things. So here we see Adam is not only just a creature who knows how to name things, who's acquiring the gift of language, but he's also a learning creature. God is teaching him. Now right here, right in this verse, and it'll come even clearer in the subsequent verses, that the very first thing that the, that the Quran is going to emphasize here is man's intellect. He is a learning creature. He is taught. And what is he taught? What is, the, what is one of the great intellectual gifts he's given in response to the angel's question? The gift of language. Because through language, mankind could not only learn, but he could learn things not only through his own experience, but he could learn things that other people have experienced of times and places that are hundreds, thousands of years and miles separated from him. And so that all our knowledge becomes cumulative. Every generation learning from the generation before it. I'm learning today from authors I read from other sides of the world that may have existed 2,000 years ago. And so we all contribute to our collective learning and knowledge. And so what I'll see later in the Quran, when the Quran will emphasize this again and again and again, like in one verse it says, read in the name of your Lord who created. Created a man out of a tiny creature that clings. Read, it commands the reader, for your Lord is most bountiful. Why is he most bountiful? What great gift did he give you? For he taught man the use of the pen, and through it taught him what he otherwise could not know. And time and time and time again, the Quran will call upon man to use his intellectual faculties and swear by his intellectual faculties and to, and to use them correctly as a, as, as, because they play a fundamental role in guiding him to truth. I never came upon a scripture that puts so much emphasis on the correct use of our intellectual faculties, on the harnessing of reason in helping us attain to faith. And he taught Adam the names of all things. And then he placed them before the angels and said, tell me their names if you are right. Okay, you have this objection to, you have this natural question about this creation of mankind. Here, this mankind is a, this a human being, this human creature is a learning creature. He has many intellectual gifts. Here, I'm going to place these things before you. Tell me their names if you are right about man. 
And what did the angels say? In the next verse they say, glory to you. We have no knowledge except what you have taught us. In truth, it is you who are knowing the wise. They say this, would be, this task, this intellectual test that's put before them is beyond their grasp. Alone is what they emphasize. We have no knowledge. This would take knowledge. This would take an intellect that they don't possess. In truth, it is you who are knowing the wise. You got it. It's easy for you. You have you're the knowing the wise. You have knowledge. You have wisdom. But this would take knowledge and wisdom that is beyond us. And so in the next verse we read, and he said, oh, Adam, tell them, tell them their names. And when he had told them their names, notice how it's just like it's nothing for him. For mankind, he has this phenomenal ability. And when he had told them their names, as if it's just a triviality for man, he names them. Oh, Adam, tell them their names. And when he had told them their names, God said, did I not tell you that I know what is unseen in the heavens and the earth? And I know what you reveal and conceal? And he's clearly going back to the angel's question. Yes, you have these natural concerns about the creation of mankind. Yes, he could do these evil things. But look at this tremendous intellect he has. This is something you have overlooked that you haven't considered. And that's clearly the point of these verses. Even though I, under, I felt that the author didn't quite, you know, it was as if I, I realized that he didn't, not, just didn't misunderstand the story. He was taking one of the great stories in the history of humankind, one of the fundamental greatest stories in the history of mankind, and molding it and using it as a vehicle for an entirely original message. <clears throat> and God said, did I not tell you that I know what is unseen in the heavens and the earth? And I know what you reveal and what you conceal. In other words, didn't I tell you I know exactly what I'm doing? And then in the next, and didn't I not tell you what I, that I know what you reveal and conceal? I looked at that. What question did their, I mean, what did they reveal and what did they conceal? What did their question reveal and conceal? I thought about it for a minute. Oh, it's obvious. What did their question reveal? You just go back and look at the question. It revealed the sinful and sinister propensities of man. I mean, it's obvious, right? Why are you all looking at me like that? <laughs> You're starting to scare me. You're all looking very serious. Am I losing you? <clears throat> wow. <laughs> okay. So they revealed the sinister and evil propensities of man. But what did their question conceal? And all you have to do is think about it for a minute. Human beings, yes, they could do evil. Yes, they could do wrong. Yes, they could create misery. But they could also do exactly the opposite. They could choose to do evil. They could choose to do tremendous good. They could choose to do tremendous violence. They could choose to show tremendous compassion. They could choose to, be, to, you know, to live by falsehood. They could choose to live by the, the greatest truths. They could be terribly ugly. They could be terribly beautiful. And I, up until that point in my life, I, like the angels, had only saw one half of one side of the coin. And for the first time when I read that verse, believe it or not, it was an eye-opener for me. I had always been <laughs> obsessed with the evil potentials of human beings. When I read that verse, I realized that, and I had a great example right in front of me with my own mom, I realized that I had been blinded by only one side of human nature. So we go on to the next verse. And behold, we said to the angels, bow down to Adam, and they bowed down. But not so Iblis. Iblis is like the father of Satan. <laughs> Satans, satanic beings, forces, creatures, existences. He refused and was arrogant. He was of those who reject faith. An interesting statement. And behold, we said to the angels, bow down to Adam. And they bowed down. Bowing down could symbolize two things. Bowing down could symbolize the superiority or potential superiority of one being over another. And so they bowed down to them. Bowing down could also mean that they serve that creature in some respect. Of course, the Quran says that all beings serve God. All created beings serve God. 
But this verse seems to be indicating, and the rest of the Quran will make it clear, that these angelic beings, these angelic uh, uh, entities, will serve the development of mankind. We'll even see later that the satanic beings serve the development of mankind. Both forces, angelic and satanic, will serve the development of mankind. Because one will present man with a choice to do the most altruistic things. The other will simultaneously try to influence man in the opposite direction. And so human, human beings will be moral creatures and will have to make moral decisions. And it's in those moral decisions that they will grow spiritually and morally as human beings. And they'll take that into the next life. And the angelic and the satanic forces will be catalysts for those moral choices that they make. They will heighten the human being's awareness of the rightfulness and the wrongfulness of the choice he's about to make. And the self, the soul, the nefs, as they say in Arabic, will have to make the ultimate choice between good and evil. And that choice, that test will come again and again and again as human beings either grow or decline. And those tests will come again and again and again to try to help him towards his spiritual evolution, to bring him back, but that choice is ultimately ours. <clears throat> but I'm getting ahead of myself. And so we said to the angels, bow down to Adam, and they bowed down. But not so Iblis, Iblis is Satan, this rebellious force, this evil prompter, the one who whispers into the human heart. He comes into being. <clears throat> And with the introduction of Satan, we have the introduction of evil, that evil influences on human beings. And notice why Iblis does not bow down. He refuses because he was arrogant. You know, we often hear the, what's the root of all evil? In the West, it's always money, greed, etc. Here the Quran says that, seems to be saying that the root of all evil is not always material wants, it's not always money, it's not always greed. At the heart of evil, is arrogance, putting yourself above all others, of assigning to yourself special priority and neglecting the rights of others, of, of, uh, of pride and arrogance and envy, the source of evil. He was of those who reject faith. I looked at that verse and I said, okay, I mean, I get why you would create angels to sort of influence man in a positive direction. But why in this story now are you introducing Satan? What sort of role does, does Satan play? And then, of course, you just think about it for a minute and you say, yes. The story is telling us that on one hand, we have these magnanimous urgings come from one direction. On the other hand, we have these satanic urgings coming from another direction. In other words, the Quran is telling us that man is not only a learning creature, but he's a moral creature. He has understanding of right and wrong. And God infuses those, allows those influences to come to him. Man is not only an intelligent being, but a moral being. <clears throat> and we said in the next verse, O oh Adam, dwell you and your spouse in the garden, and eat freely thereof what you wish, and eat freely thereof what you wish. But come not near uh, this tree, for then you will be among the wrongdoers. I looked at this first, and I was you know, starting to wonder if the author was drifting back to the old story again. I was confused. And we said, O oh Adam, dwell you and your spouse in a garden, and eat freely thereof what you wish, but come not near this tree, for you will be among the wrongdoers. I thought it was drifting back to the old story. Man sins, man's punished for his sins with earthly life. Maybe the author is drifting. He had a good idea, and now he's drifting back to the sort of traditional story. Maybe he couldn't man make his mind up what story he wanted. Except for a couple things about this verse, and this happened with almost every verse as I read through it, is that uh, the whole tenor of the passage is sort of uh, not the, what you would expect. I noticed that the Quran in this story has a tremendous penchant for understating things. Because it says, uh, and said to Adam, dwell you and your spouse in the garden, and eat freely thereof what you wish, to Adam and his spouse. But come not near this tree, for you will be among the wrongdoers. I mean, there's no sense of God being threatened by the possibility of man eating from the tree. In this story, we don't see that, you know, in this verse, we don't see that God is nervous at the prospect, that he's threatened by the prospect, that he's anxious about it. The tree that he picks, he picks it seems like he's just picking out any tree. Nothing special about the tree. 
go not near uh, this tree, for you will be among the wrongdoers. Satan will later come to him and tell him it's a tree of eternal life, of a kingdom that never decays. Turns out to be a complete faucet in his part. Nothing special about the tree. It's just a tree. God's not nervous at the prospect at all. You know, in the tradition that I came from, God is threatened by the prospect. He has to put an angel with a fiery sword, a sword by to protect the tree so that mankind never goes next to it again. I'm not putting it down. I'm just pointing out the difference of the story. They're both beautifully told. But he you know, has to guard the tree. Why? Because if they eat from it, they'll become gods like us. This man, he saw already, has a rebellious nature. Can you imagine if he eats from the, this tree? No, can't let him get near that tree. <clears throat> but here, just you know, calmly says, you know, but if you do, you will be among the wrongdoers. God is not worried about himself. It's just warning man, making it clear that if you do this, you've committed a wrongful deed. <clears throat> Again, the, the whole tenor of the past, all these verses that you read through it is God knows exactly what he's doing. Okay, next verse. But Satan caused them to slip and expelled them from the state in which they were. And we said, go you all down, some of you being the enemies of others, and on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. What, I said? <laughs> I mean... You know, I was expecting now the rage, the anger, the violence, the jealousy. That's what I was expecting. Okay, they eat from the tree. Where's the rage, the violence? I'm going to punish you now. You're going to sweat on earth. And you're going to suffer and you're going to stub your toe and you're going to work and you're going to labor. And you're going to die there for what you did. And where's the woman? All right. <laughs> And the woman, right? She's the one who's going to suffer the most, right? She'll have to suffer labor pains and monthly cycles, right? And bleeding and crying out when her children come into the world. She'll scream out. And worst of all, the greatest humiliation, the man will rule over her. When he's obviously her intellectual inferior because she and the angels seduced, she and, she, she and Satan seduced him and he just bumbled along and didn't commit a real, you know, wrong deed. <laughs> well, I don't mean to make light of it. But the story is obviously different though. You know, no, no threat here. As a matter of fact, look at the way it says, Oh Adam, dwell you and your spouse in the garden and eat freely thereof what you wish. But come not near this tree, for you will be among the wrongdoers. Then they make the mistake. But Satan caused them to slip and expelled them from the state in which they were. And we said, go all you down. Some of you being enemies of others will be adversaries of others. Some of you will be adversaries of each other. And on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. This is not a deity losing it. If you look at it, I mean, on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. That's not the words of a, of a God that has got lost you know, that is really extremely upset. On earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. <clears throat> but notice something else about this verse. I mean, when you read these verses for the first time, I don't know, maybe I'm nuts. And many people think I am. But when you read these verses for the first time, I mean, this is just so much that catches your attention. But Satan caused them to slip. I remember, I, I couldn't get that verse out of, that, those words out of my head. Satan caused them to slip. To slip? The greatest sin in the history of the human race, and it's called a slip? You know, in my culture, slip means, you know, you just momentarily, for a fraction of a second, you lose your focus. It's not a big deal. My Uncle Bob used to always say to me, uh, Jeff, I'm sorry, I'm five minutes late, I slipped up. You know, it's, the understanding is it's no big deal, it's just a slip. You know, that's what we say when we make a minor mistake. I slipped up. Don't worry about it. Never happen again. A slip, I said? Momentary loss of focus? The greatest sin in the history of humanity? Why we're all here? Why we're all suffering? Why we experience death? A slip? I didn't believe it. I went to my Arabian friends at that time. I didn't know any Arabic. They came to this verse. We went through it line by line. I said, now don't change any words. Just read them one at a time. But Satan made them. And I said, okay, this one. This one right here. 
What does it mean? Tell me what that means. They looked at it, it says, uh, slip. <laughs> slip. And expelled them from the state in which they were. A slip, I thought? But then maybe I was trying to force the traditional understanding, the traditional interpretation. Maybe it was just a slip. I mean, after all, they didn't commit murder. They didn't commit robbery, rape, pillaging, assault. They ate a, a couple of pieces of fruit. Well, it's not the greatest sin in the history of humanity by any means. And then the next verse says, and then they were expelled from the state in which they were. Well, what state were they? Let's see now. Let's go back from where we started. First, mankind is being taught. We see he's an intellectual being. Then we show he's a moral being. Moral being means he's a being that's going to have to make choices. And then God gives him this choice. It's not a huge deal. It's not the gravest sin in the history of humanity by any means. It's minor by any standards. They make it, though. We see that God originally intended to put man on earth as his vicegerent. We see a period of preparation where he's being prepared intellectually, where he's growing intellectually, where he's growing as a moral creature. When does God finally put him on earth? What signals that he's ready to begin? He makes his first independent choice. It's not the worst deed in the history of humanity. It's minor on anybody's scale, but it shows that mankind is ready to act on his own, to be his own, to make his own choices, that God has empowered him to make choices, and he's ready to make them and carry them out and see them most often to their expected ends, if God wills. <clears throat> And that seems to be the only real significance of it. But I thought, maybe I'm getting this wrong. Maybe God just blows off into an angry rampage the next verse. So I look at the next one and it says, And then Adam received words from his Lord. And he turned, then God turned to him mercifully. For he's oft returning, ever merciful. Well, if I had any doubts up till now that God is not enraged by what this has happened, that God hasn't prepared mankind for this choice, for what was eventually going to happen. That all this was preparation for mankind to begin his earthly sojourn in this famous allegory. If I had any doubts before now, I had them, certainly didn't have them after reading this verse. 